Fabulous Fundraisers. I'm Don Lego. It's time once again to buckle up for a new episode of Raise Nation Radio, the one and only podcast made to inspire fundraisers like you to continue making impact in our communities, building better tomorrows and exchanging ideas. So whether you're a trailblazer or seasoned pro, you'll pick up the trends that transform your fundraising. And together we'll dive into lively conversations and chat with industry leading fundraisers and thought leaders to explore hot button issues and innovative ideas. So stay with us for the next 30 minutes while we inspire you to embrace the future of fundraising. Well, hello there, Raise Nation Radio. It's so good to be back with you again for another wonderful episode. We have a very special nonprofit organization with us today, and I'm real excited to uh, just jump in because... Raise Nation Radio is all about um, inspiring stories, and this one's really going to get you at your heart. So um, I would sit back, relax, or if you're driving, be safe. Just make sure you have some tissues near you because you might need them for this episode. But it's just very exciting to have some trailblazers in um, the indie area, actually, where One Cause is, is calls home, and um, just to tell their story um, uh, and their impact that they're making in the com- communities. So very special friends to One Cause and um, just really a pleasure and, and delightful um, women that are joining us. We have Madison Gonzalez, the executive director of Morning Light with us. Good morning, Madison. How are you? I know Good you're morning, under the Dawn. weather today. I yeah, know you're feeling yeah, a little I, bit under the weather. <laughs> yeah, but I'm still showing up. I'm still here. I'm so excited ah. um, to be part of this today. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you are showing up. Talk about just coming out of the gate with inspiration. So thank you for that. Um, but we're also joined by Brittany Babbitt, who's um, the program support manager at Morning Light. And Brittany's joining us today. Hi, Brittany. Welcome to Raise Nation Radio. Hi, Dawn. Thank you so much for having us this morning. We're happy to be here. Yeah, it's super exciting. I, I can't wait to dive in and talk about everything that you're doing at Morning Light. It was so good to see both of you. What was that? A couple of weeks ago, um, we went. We had we had a nice little event at was it three one four or three one seven charcuterie mm-hmm. in um, in uh, Carmel. was it yeah. Carmel? Carmel? Yeah, Carmel. That's right. So you were both so sweet. You came out for Steve John's one of Steve John's book signing events, and uh, the three of us just grabbed a table. You think you would have thought that it was a place for three because we just <laughs> had a really neat chat. But it was good to see you both. Yeah, great to see you too, and. Um... As long as charcuterie is involved, Brittany and I will always be there. Oh, good point. Good <laughs> point. Yeah, I'm into charcuterie myself. So that that's pretty cool. So did you get to read any bit of Fearless yet? Uh, a cha- I don't mean to put you on the spot, but did you get through the first chapter or anything just yet? Yeah, so I, I was able to kind of go through with a highlighter. I love the format because it's so bite-sized. Um, so it, it is, makes it yeah. really easy to read, um, you know, each I think each little section of the book is kind of a a week by week update of what it looked like through the pandemic. And I just found that really interesting to to read back through because we were all right there in the trenches together. So, um, yeah, I recommend the book. I really like it. Oh, great. Good, good to, good to know. Well, let's get into some introductions. Our audience wants to know you, um, and this is a cozy little place, Raise Nation Radio. So um, we'll start with you, um, Madison. If you just want to share a little bit about who you are, what you do for Morning Light, how did it all start, and whatever you might want to share personally, our audience wants to get to know you. So take it away. Absolutely. Um, so I am Madison Gonzalez. I've been with Morning Light now for about five and a half years. Uh, my story is kind of a funny one because I did start um, in this organization just part time. Um, I had had a couple of little ones and I was looking to reenter the workforce. Uh, my background is in special events. And um, I knew that when I came back to work, I wanted to do work that made a difference. Um, so I just kind of put out into the universe that I wanted to work for a nonprofit um, and be able to help, you know, use my event skills to help raise money for a good cause. And um, 
at the time I wasn't, you know, very picky about where I started. I was new to the nonprofit world. So I did take a part-time administrative assistant position um, and started at Morning Light, just kind of scanning invoices and, you know, taking minutes for committee meetings and just kind of the odd jobs that no one else really wanted to do. Um, but I did get to learn a lot about the organization inside and out. Um, and to share a little about what we do, uh, which really I had no uh, prior experience to was hospice. And I know that hospice is a scary word for many people. Um, it has a stigma about it, uh, but hospice is that final chapter, you know, the end of life. Um, and what we do is we provide free living accommodations and, uh, you know, three home cooked meals a day and comfort, care, round the clock, hand to hold uh, for individuals who don't have anywhere else to go. Um, and are terminally ill. So you can imagine how, you know, scary that might be to be terminal and then scary that might be to be homeless or without resources or finances or, you know, support system. And so we really, uh, you know, try to to catch a group of individuals in a stage of life where they really deserve it. And, it, you know, we just want to validate them at the end of life um, and tell them that their humanity matters. And so, you know, with, with such a compelling mission, um, I was hooked and I really became uh, passionate, I think, when I started to get to talk to the individuals that we serve and start to get their stories. And um, I guess I had a knack for that because I started collecting the stories and sharing them and it started to get us some press and attention and, um, you know, a little bit of a footprint here in the Indianapolis community where we're located. Uh, and in 2019, actually, I won the Storyteller of the Year, or Morning Light won the Storyteller yes. of the Year Award through One Cause at the Rays Conference. And so, you know, that was a, that was a huge boost of confidence for me. Um, so I'm grateful, you know, for One Cause recognizing that. And, and storytelling has just become my passion. Um, and I think it's that gift and just that passion behind um, communication and just trying to humanize our mission that now I'm kind of the face for it. Uh, I, I was given the opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, grow, I suppose, as a professional. And now I'm executive director of this organization. And so very, very happy to be here and continue to see how Morning Light can make an impact and a difference and how I can continue to serve the people that we help. Yeah, you're, you are an inspiration. I, I'll give you a little behind the scenes secret here at One Cause. Um, I am one of the judges for that storytelling oh. or the year <laughs> award. I I've been so, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I've been so for a year and I do remember reading your application. I mean, you just are so inspiring about how you go about telling a story and making a very clear picture about the need. And it, I have to say, I, I log on to your uh, website and the opening line is, we are a home for terminally ill people with nowhere else to go. And right there, I, you have to stop in your tracks. Whoa, like what? Terminally ill, nowhere else to go. It's just uh, overwhelming, really, to think about. You almost don't want to think about it. Um, and so we're going to dive a little bit into that and uh, just, you know, share a little bit more about the dignity and the peace maybe that you bring to the clients that you serve. But we want to get to know Brittany first, too, um, and uh, just share her story and her why and her journey to Morning Light. I, Brittany, if I understand correctly, you're newer to the Morning Light team, but that passion is nonetheless um screaming with inside of you so why don't you introduce yourself and get to know our audience and let them get to know you a little bit better too well thank you again my name is Brittany and I'm the program support manager at morning light and when we met Dawn I think that was one of like my second or third day um, on <laughs> day the two. morning light team <laughs> so it was a great introduction to this experience um, but although I am recently new to the team, I have been a volunteer of Morning Light for about five years. Um, so Madison and I have known each other previously, but I started with Morning Light as a volunteer and grew to love the mission. And it really aligned with what I enjoy doing. Um, and it's making people feel welcomed and identifying needs um, 
within our community and within each other and try to connect those um, to those other services that can be offered. So I was actually a bank manager. So I have been in retail banking for eight years. <laughs> okay, and... that's a crossover <laughs> career. Okay. It is. I am. A, I have a little experience, I guess, with asking people for money. So that's not completely foreign in the fundraising department. Uh, but I would say that my specialty and what led to my success in retail banking was making people feel welcomed when they came in our doors. And so I was fortunate to work for an organization that fostered that and encouraged that, um, but also gave me the opportunity to go out in the community and volunteer. And so for many years, I would log hundreds of hours of volunteering, some with morning light, but most at my church um, where I serve currently as an elder. So I, during 2020, I really got a special look at caring for um kind of the underserved community in the sense of those who are homebound, hospitalized, nowhere to go. Um, When I served on the Congregational Care Committee, where that was our entire ministry, was to reach out to families who have lost a loved one to offer bereavement care, um, to honor their loved one with the memorial service every year, um, but to also reach out to those who were isolated and lonely um, within our congregation and in the broader community. So I was, I guess, fortunate um, to have led that initiative with the Board of Deacons at the time, um, but also be on the receiving end of it. Um, Today is actually, I think, the third anniversary of my grandma's, grandmother's funeral. And so when she passed, it was during 2020. And just to experience the work that I was helping to initiate, um, to be on the receiving end of that made it all the more important um, to continue it on. And so when I was um, kind of thinking of my five-year plan and where I wanted to be, I wanted to find something um, that made my volunteering and my efforts full-time. And so having been a volunteer, like I said, of Morning Light, I Um, felt it was a perfect fit. So that way I can continue that experience of welcoming service, um, but also care for those who have no one else to care for them, but also make everyone that walks through the doors still feel welcomed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that I think you're right. It was day two, but you would think that you were there for 20 years, you know, the way you were, the way you were talking and how you're positioning yourself. And um, I, I feel like you slid right in and found a home. Um, but what's interesting to me is both of you had kind of a similar journey journey in that you came to Morning Light in a much different place, right? I, Madison, you were part-time mommy doing just whatever, whatever needed to be done. You, you know, file this, do it. Right. Okay. Order lunch. Okay. I I got that. Um, you know, jump and ask somebody for donation. Great. And now look at you executive director and, um, but you're also a thought leader too, because you've spoken at the raise conference, I believe. Um, yes. And, and for those, uh, for those out there who don't know or are not familiar yet with raise one cause, um, sponsors a, annual conference. This year will be um, in Nashville at the Country Music Hall of Fame. You want to check it out. It's in September. And um, we, um, together with all of our sponsors, put on a two-day conference that's just the industry's top thought leaders. It's full, of, chock full of content and education and networking and um everything that you would want as a fundraiser. And Madison has been a speaker for us in addition to an award winner, because we do have an awards component to that conference. So you're just recognized here, there, and everywhere, which I want to talk about in just a minute as well. But then Brittany, you also started as a volunteer. So you both came in at very, you know, in a place where you're seeing and hearing everything. And now you've carved out like some leadership, um, you know, opportunities at Morgan. And I find that very interesting. I wonder if that um, helps you both be the leaders that you are. The fact that you were 
at a different place and a different level within the organization. Do you feel that that's true? Just coming in as the person that says, okay, I'll do anything. What what do you need? Okay. Got that. Right. Close up, open up. Okay. Call the electric company, whatever it is. And then for Brittany, you just, how can I help? What can I do? How can I be involved? Do you think that's me? Do the leaders that you are today? I think so. I think, yes, I think you, you know, this idea that you really shouldn't be asking people to do things that you wouldn't do yourself. Um, and then showing, you know, your team that you are willing to roll up your sleeves and get in there as well. Um, now morning light is a smaller organization, uh, and we are a small development team. I mean, it really is the two of us on this call. Um, but also, you know, starting to think outside the box on how we can help other members of our team learn about fundraising and the nonprofit component and how we do what we do. But that crossover between fundraising and programming for us is crucial because, you know, for us to be able to go into the program side of things and sit with the individuals that we serve um, and stay grounded in the mission in that way, Um, I think really helps us tell the story that much better. And I think it helps build a stronger team as well um, for them to know that we are there and supporting them and have been where they are um, in terms of, you know, those who are actually carrying out our mission. And I think that if you're going to um, come up with innovative ideas and uh, come up with things that can help take an organization to the next level, you have to know how it's already been working and you have to know what works, what doesn't work, how we can maybe cut the fat to some of the um, you know, processes and things and how we can maybe come up with new solutions for things that we keep running into. Um, so I definitely think that you know, I guess growing in an organization in this way has helped me figure out the components of the organization that I'd like to keep. And then the components of the organization that I think we can do better at, because there's always room to grow. Well, well, beautifully said, Um, Brittany, I think you were going to add something. Do do you feel that your volunteer experience has contributed to your leadership today? Absolutely. Um, I would, um, that's how you get to learn the organization. Uh, When you are actually doing some of those tasks that maybe someone doesn't want to do, um, it's how you learn from the ground up, but also um, how you can support others. There is not something that I'm asking another person to do that I haven't done myself, whether that is sitting with a resident or if that is cleaning. Um, I'd like to get to the point where I know every aspect of it and I know what needs to be done and I know what like Madison said, where we can cut areas as well. Um, But that's how we learn to support and inspire our teams of volunteers and of staff um, by coming in and also having done the work ourselves. We are all working towards the same goal. Um, So there is not one thing that is less important than another um, when it comes to serving our residents. Wow. Talk about inspiration. You're both so, so inspiring. And I think that um, the clients that you serve have that a a little piece of something that's, that's really special in in such a difficult and challenging time of their, their lives. So we're grateful to both of you and applaud both of you for the work that you're doing. So I think it, it, it is a good time to segue to a conversation that's a little delicate, right? Tell us about the clients that you serve and how you serve them. Let's talk a little bit about impact. How many do you serve? Where, what does the history of Morning Light look like in terms of their impact? And um, just the programming, you know, that you offer, um, it's 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 a rough time, a, a really rough time, and, and doesn't really end on a high note. So um, I imagine this conversation is going to be a little difficult, but it, we need to talk about it because how how else are we going to get support? And I think those stories are important. Madison, why don't we start with you um, and maybe tackle a little bit of that question? Some of it, all of it, would whatever you want to share. Absolutely. So um, I think in our culture, death definitely has a stigma and it is something that people might be turning their radios off to now, but I encourage you not to because um, it is inevitable 
And it is something that we all as a community can do a lot better at in supporting each other through, whether that's somebody, you know, that we've lost ourselves, whether that's us, you know, who have have struggled or are, are going to be sick at some point, you know, how would you like to be cared for? And what does that look like? And having these conversations um, is so important. You know, it's, it's one of those, like I said, the hospice has this stigma um, that it is scary and dark and sad, and it's not always that. That way it can be light it can be peaceful it can be um, validating for some of our residents this is the first time in their life and this is you know been told to us that they've actually felt held and seen and mm-hmm. it's unfortunate that that's happening you know in the end of their life but for many people you can imagine those who don't have anywhere to go at the end of life or anyone to help care for them society has failed them at some point you know mm-hmm. and society has not said you matter and you your humanity is a beautiful, valuable thing, you know? And so for us to be able to capture people, even if it's in their final stage, but to tell them that message and to show them what love and compassion and care looks like is exactly why we're here. Um, We've served 800 people uh, since we've opened our doors. We are a 12 bedroom home. I encourage you to look at our website um, because it is absolutely a stunning home. It isn't just, um, you know, some hole in the wall home. It is on its beautiful. beautiful. Yeah pastoral, you know, front yard and big lofted ceilings and bright windows. And every resident has their own bedroom. And that might be the first time in their life they've ever had a warm bed to count on and three home cooked meals coming their way and a shower um, and, and someone to sit by them and read to them or hold their hand. Um, They have a door that opens up to this garden in the back. That's just a lovely, peaceful, serene place to be. And we call it a sacred space. When you think about 800 lives and souls kind of passing through that home, it is a very sacred space. And so, um, you know, I think that we need to be careful about identifying death as this scary thing because it's natural and it's normal and it's not an emergency. It is something that, you know, we are all going to embrace at some point. Um, And we do have more power and control in it if we start to have these conversations earlier. Um, Of course, the fear of the unknown is scary. But what we do know is that at least at the Abby Hunt Bryce home, there's a community of people that we're growing and we'll get to that soon with our volunteer program, I hope, um, which is why, you know, one of the reasons we brought Brittany on. Um, but, you know, it's it's to grow the circle of people who feel more comfortable in this conversation so that they can take it home to their own families and communities so that people who are at the end of life aren't isolated, aren't feeling like, why, where did my family and friends go? You know, because we're afraid to approach that subject. Um, And so I hope that our impact is a big one. You know, I know that, you know, we do have 800 individuals that have passed on, um, but many of them do have family, you know, it's just not a family circumstance or situation that the family can care for them 24 seven, like they need. And so I would argue that our impact numbers are, are bigger than 800, you know, because we've, we've, relieved that caregiving burden from so many families that feel guilty for not being able to provide the care that they need, you know, to their loved one. Um, And so they can become that daughter again, or that son again, or that spouse again, and just come in and sit with them instead of having to, you know, bathe them and, and change their, their, you know, briefs and clean up sickness and, and all these different things, right. They can just be that, that More loved quality one. relationship. Yeah, a quality relationship. And I think yeah. that's part of the impact that we have. And so, you know, you put me on my soapbox and I can talk about this all day, but I think that we are daring to tackle a topic that a lot of people are not um, willing to talk about. And so hopefully can do so in a loving and comfortable environment and a beautiful, bright environment that kind of turns that stigma of hospice on its head and says, this might be actually one of the most beautiful times of your life. Well, you're going to make me cry. Wow. That's why you have so many awards <laughs> oh. for morning light. And you <laughs> just, it's just, it really, it is beautiful and sad and, and heartwarming and challenge all at the same time. Um, but so appreciate you casting that light. You, you know, the spaces are beautiful, like the Abby Hunt Bryce home. Um, Brittany, perhaps you can talk about that, you know, as the, uh, you know, um, programming 
um, hat there at Morning Light. There's the Abbey Hunt Bryce home. I think there's um, Penwood Place. And then, of course, there's training that has to do be ongoing every day, all day, recruiting new, training more, because it's it's not just a home, here's a room. We we're we're talking about making these final days or days beautiful. I would assume some training needs to go along with that. So do you want to comment on all of the different programming at Morning Light? Absolutely. Um so we actually had our second contemplative care training the other day where we had about 15 people in the room, which was awesome for the second time. Um, I think that what was so interesting for me when even when I was leaving banking and talking to volunteers as I got here um, was everybody's experience with hospice. Um, They have joined because they either had a loved one who went through hospice and it was an extremely sacred experience and they had a great hospice team and were fortunate enough to have made that decision early or not early enough to benefit from it. Um, but then there's the other side too, where people have come in and they wish they had done, um, provided hospice care for their loved ones sooner. And so there is that kind of regret. And so with our program, we really want to invite people in to kind of serve themselves first in order to be able to serve others. So we want to provide um, some support, whether that's grief support um, or just a sacred space to come and feel relaxed and be in community with other people um, who, yes, may be receiving hospice care, but also other caregivers as well, which is why we encourage our staff um, to kind of go through this training Um, as well as our volunteers. So that way, everybody learns different tools and tactics in order to fill their own cup first. Um, Because I do think that there are many people um, that care, that want to be involved, that are aware that this is going, death is going to happen in their life at some point, um, but they're trying to postpone it as possible. And that's what we want to kind of speak against. We want to start talking about it now. um, So that way, we all have the tools to share with others in our own lives within the Abbey home in order to kind of honor each other's lives while we're all still here and can acknowledge each other um, and our own gifts that we've brought to this earth. Wow. So how do you do it both of you? You know, it's basically a team of two and, and a community of volunteers. There's home upkeep and programming and training and telling the story and fundraising, right? This can't be inexpensive to keep these programs together. How, how do you do it all and, and get it all done and do it all so well and almost be like a little bit calm about it, right? You're, yeah. you have so many people in front of you that need you. They're facing the last days of their life. They would otherwise have nowhere else to go. You may in some respects be extending their lives because with nowhere else to go, that to me maybe seems like it would chop off a few days, but perhaps you've given uh, the gift of extra days of living and you're, you're, you're helping people be peaceful and calm and full and, and maybe live the best lives in those last mo- How do you do it all? Fundraising, training. I'm tired just talking about it. Now, Madison, go for you. How do you get this all done? So it's definitely not just us. Um, I want to definitely give a a big shout out to our home manager, Julia, who um, is kind of the, the ringmaster over at the home. She's a social worker um, and she just has one of the biggest hearts I've ever seen. Um, she keeps things definitely rocking and rolling. Uh, and then we have a team of caregivers that we do train. Um, and, you know, hopefully they've had maybe some caregiving experience in the past, but if they haven't, um, this is where our our training comes in. And, and this, this way of thinking is relatively new. And I think that what kind of prompted this thinking was our caregiving shortage. Um, You know, after COVID, a lot of people in the healthcare space retired, um, or they left, or they switched industries, or they burnt out, or they became extremely expensive and, and something that not necessarily a little nonprofit can afford. And so, um, 
you know, we had to come up with innovative ways to invite the community to come and participate so that we can keep our doors open because there is a caregiving shortage. And with that caregiving shortage, also saying, okay, morning light needs to have a voice in this. We need to teach people that this is natural and normal and here's how we do it. And so, you know, my, my goal is to go out and attract people um, who want to be part of this. And so, you know, we have a marketing committee, we have a board of directors, we have people in the Indianapolis space that have gifts. And so finding what other people's strengths are and then leveraging those strengths means that we can accomplish our goals. Um, I do not do it by myself. <laughs> Brittany does not do it by herself. Um, so I think, you know, it really does take a village. Um, and the idea is that you have to get your, your mission right, your messaging right, tell the story, and the right people will be attracted to what you are doing. And with that, you know, attracting people who have the heart is what we try to do. Um, finding people who have that, just passion and that drive to want to make a difference is crucial because skills can be taught. And so these ways of thinking, um, when it comes to the contemplative caregiving training that Brittany's talking about, um, you know, these are mindful tactics for how to calm yourself and how to maintain a presence. And so for you to say, you know, we come off calm is a good thing because um, that's what we're trying to teach other people to do is take a deep breath. Um, you know, we are running at such a fast pace most of the time, and that's not always healthy. And then if we bring that fast pace chaos into, you know, the lives of those who maybe are on a decline, um, that's not caregiving, you know, that's bringing chaos. And so um, the importance of, you know, pausing and breathing and meditating and journaling and coloring and all these things, they're not selfish. They're, they're sustainable methods for how you keep yourself centered so you can serve at your best. Because if you're tapped out and if you're exhausted and if you're short fused and short tempered, you know, as a fundraiser, you're going to be coming off a certain way, maybe desperate, maybe chaotic, maybe not attracting from a place of, hey, listen to this really cool thing that we're doing in the community that people need. Um, it's coming off different. And so your energy that you bring to the table is so important. Um, and so I would say, you know, making sure that you're caring for yourself and and do as I say, and not always as I do, because I don't have this all perfect either. I definitely can run myself tired sometimes. That's, that might be why I'm sick today. <laughs> you know, I might be sick because I do work really hard, um, but it's an intention. You know, it's an intention to go into each day and try and take some time for yourself and to take days off when, you know, you still have a huge huge laundry list of things to do, like allowing yourself that balance between working and playing, um, which are my, you know, two things that I gravitate towards, but also resting. Um, and so I guess my advice would be, you know, take care of yourself and do what you need to do because it's not selfish. It is, it's self-sustaining and it's needed. Um, and then two, seek out your circle, you know, seek out the people who naturally gravitate towards what you're doing because they will have skills and don't try and force your message and your mission on everybody because that's wasted energy. Um, and so as fundraisers, I guess my advice would be, you know, your mesh, your miss, uh, your mission, excuse me, is not for everybody. Um, not everybody will like it and that's okay. You just move to the next one because death isn't for everybody. <laughs> Hospice isn't for everybody. Uh, but to have 15 people in the room who are raising their hand to say, I want to learn more about this and I want to come and be involved. It, it's proof that it is for somebody. And so just move along, you know, and, and find the right people and find your tribe and find the circle. And then they will bring the strengths and leverage those strengths to help your organization be successful. Well, I feel we need to um, get a t-shirt made or a sign or some swag that says the three things that you just outlined, mission, <laughs> right? Mes message, right? Tell your story, right? That's, that's the heart of, of good fundraising. And I, I think we got to work on a t-shirt next time I see okay. you, we'll all be, we'll all be sporting um, that t-shirt. So, how, all right inspired, right? I am super inspired. I want to come to work at morning light now. Um, how, how do we get involved? Right. I'm sure what, what do you need? What do you need most? 
and how would someone get involved? And we're going to get all of this on the show notes too, right? So when we drop this episode, you can just go to the show notes and we're going to have, you know, the website and social and how to get in touch with Madison and Brittany and all that. But let's just talk about what do you need right now? What do you need the most and how can people get involved? Thank you for asking that question. It's my favorite question. Uh, please go to our website. Um, and I know you said you'll drop that in the show notes. Our website, I think, does a great job of telling our story. And um, hopefully you can kind of tell what we need. Um, of course, um, we always need volunteers. And that's really what we're seeking to grow right now. Um, and Brittany and I have thought a lot about what we want our volunteer program to look like, and we want it to be a symbiotic relationship. And I think that's something that is really necessary in this day and age is that people are very um, guarded of their time, you know, and they they are very um, selective on where they spend it. And so we want our volunteer um, experience to be one that fills your cup, as we said, and not just ask for something in return. But volunteering can look like all kinds of things. Um, that can be that bedside companionship. That can be making meals. Um, it, hey, if you want to door dash a meal to us, that would be wonderful. Our our staff oh. cooks all the time. So, um, you know, our our home's address is on the website. Door dash a meal. We would love that. Um, there's always, you know, ways to give, of course. I mean, I'm asking fundraisers for money, but you know, I'm not above it. <laughs> we have a really cool program um, called the Last Wish Campaign. Uh, and for just $25 a month, um, you can sponsor a resident's last wish. And so when somebody comes to us, we say, hey, if there could be one final thing that you could do, what would that be? Um, and then we get creative. So um, we have someone that we're setting up for a backstage uh, kind of or backstage, I guess, or back behind the scenes um, at the zoo. Um, we have a resident who is is Hispanic and he wanted um, chocolate. That's like all he asks for is just chocolate, but but chocolate from Mexico because American chocolate and Mexican chocolate taste different. And so we put that out on LinkedIn and we started getting chocolate delivered, um, oh, you know, Mexican gosh, chocolate beautiful. delivered. And so um, there's these cool little last wishes that we've got going on. And so if you if you do want to give and support, I think that's a great way to do it. And it's very tangible. Um, and $25 and also, a month. I mean, that's only $300 a year. Exactly. Um, I don't, I don't want to say only because I mean, it, times are crazy financially. Sure. But $300 a year, I mean, I drop that on sillier things like, you know, Starbucks, actually. I'm, a, yeah. I'm a sad to admit. So $300 to grant somebody their very last wish um, doesn't seem to me like a high, I, can, I, don't, I can't believe you can do it for that little. So that's a wonderful way to just know that you're you're helping. I also love the DoorDash idea. You can do that from anywhere, right? Absolutely. You yeah. You don't Florida. have to be Indianapolis local to do that. Um, and so, you know, one, again, volunteering, um, we need, we always need help at special events. We have several of those going on. You can find those on our website. Um, uh, obviously companionship, if you are local to us, uh, get us a meal. We would love that. Grant a last wish. We would love that. And then third, just start having these conversations. Um, just be open to the idea of end of life and what that looks like. Um, even if we don't ever come into contact with you, you know, if, if I don't hear from you, hopefully this, um, you know, this conversation kind of inspired you to maybe start to consider how you can support somebody in your life at the end of their life. And to me, that's impact. And to me, that's helping Morning Light execute its mission because, Really, we just want everyone's end of life to have care and dignity. And that's yeah. that's the Peace. bottom line. Yeah. I you know, I think um I'm going to make an observation about your success. You know, I feel just like when we were together in Indy a couple of weeks ago and today now on Raise Nation Radio, we're we're just having a transparent, authentic, candid conversation. I feel that's how you run Morning Light um, as executive director, Madison, because what struck me is that you needed chocolate from Mexico. So, well, you just, well, why not authentically say that you need chocolate from Mexico <laughs> and, and put it on LinkedIn and here it is, right? So I feel like you just have a very natural, authentic, honest, open approach, which is probably contributing 
um, to your success. Um, so congratulations on that. I think Thank you even saying. Steve John's book, it talks about that being, being an authentic, vulnerable, fearless leader. Um, you know, you, you define that, um, and Madison and Brittany, both of you, I think it's just probably some of the secret sauce to your success. Um, I want to just maybe touch a little bit on fundraising if we can. Um, I know we have just a few more minutes left, but, um, you know, you said it takes a village. It also takes funds, right? I don't know that $300 per donor a year is going to take care of the facility and the upkeep and the training and, you know, the meta, all the things that need to be taken care of. So what does your fundraising look like and and how, um, how how can people donate and um, what do you attribute to your fundraising success? I would say, um, so our fundraising success has definitely spiked since we've gotten the stories right. Um, human to human, um, you know, showcase a actual person that your mission is is serving um, and you create that bridge because hospice is an arbitrary kind of abstract conversation, right? And uh, maybe not everyone can visualize what that looks like. But if I show you an individual and I tell you his name is Richard and that he loves milkshakes and that his life was, you know, rough up until this point and that he isn't going to have a headstone, but we are going to inscribe a brick in his honor. This is a story that suddenly humanizes what we are trying to do. Um, And so uh, that's what I speak on at at the conferences most of the time is the art of storytelling and how important that is. So A, I think story is is very important. B, um, we have several, you know, events throughout the year, of course, um, but events aren't uh, everything, you know, they are definitely something and they're definitely a great way to get new people introduced to your organization. Um, But I'll be honest, we need to do better as an organization if we're going to stay sustainable. Um, We've definitely, you know, we've increased about 250% in the last couple of years for what we're fundraising. Um, But if we want to last forever and ever, we need to, uh, we need to do better. And so this is also part of the volunteer initiative, um, bringing people into the home to uh, become attached, right? To understand that this is a place for them as much as as it is a place for our residents. Um, You know, by getting that community buy-in, by actually making it a hub and a place that people feel seen and heard as human beings, as the community, uh, you are laying the groundwork for that financial support. There's a statistic out there that um, volunteers are 100 times more likely to give to your cause. And so by growing that um, volunteer pool in a very intentional way, that is, again, symbiotic and uh, humanizing, um, we're hoping that then, you know, our volunteers will want to make sure that we stick around and that when it does come time to say, okay, maybe we're going to have a capital campaign or set a big, you know, hairy goal for our fundraising um, for that evergreen campaign, we have enough people up under us that we can go and, um, you know, let them know that this is what's going to be needed if this home is going to stay around for good. Wow. So do you have any upcoming events that um, the Indy area should be knowing about that? Or are you still in the planning stage? Oh, I'm what glad do we need you asked. Oh, okay. You know, What's yes, going on? Um, Tell me. I'll, so, I'll plan my trips to Indies if I could. Because yes, yes, yes. um, the audience knows I'm in New Jersey, but um, I've been with One Cause for a little bit of time now. And um, I get I get that permission to head over to Indy every now and again. So give it to me. I gotta, I'm opening my calendar right now. Okay. So we have a very cool event on, uh, it's close. It's April the 14th. It's a Friday night. Um, it's at the Speakeasy in Broad Ripple. If anyone is familiar with the Broad Ripple area, it's a very cool artsy area in Indianapolis. Um, and we are having dessert in the dark. So it's a dessert auction. Dessert in the dark. Yes, that ma'am. is awesome. Okay. And, I'm intrigued. If you didn't catch the fun little pun, so we're morning light and this is night light, right? And so right. we're having it in the dark. Um so cool. and it will be You're lit. so clever. Oh God, that was so good. Okay. <laughs> I like it. It's uh it's going to be lit by 800 flameless uh candles to honor the 800 individuals that 
the Abbey Hunt Bryce home is served. And so the impact is very prevalent at this event. Um, you'll just need to look around the room and see all of the candles um, to see all of the people that have benefited from our organization. Uh, we have a quartet on strings um, playing some oh, contemporary wow. music. So it's a really fun evening and again, a very low buy-in. So it's only $20 for a ticket. Um, oh, we have light wow. appetizers, um, and then we'll be auctioning off desserts. So, uh, it's a great date night. It's a great family night. It's a great girls night out. Um, you know, just coming and, um, it's a Friday night. Like I said, be surrounded by candles and beautiful music and eat some cheesecake. And it's a good time. Um, and then our biggest event that we always host, uh, which One Cause has always been very helpful with, is beach ball. Um, so it's a it's it's historically been a very casual event. So, um, you know, while a lot of galas are taking place, we've always had this very casual event, which is called beach ball, and it's beach themed, and um, it's it's always a lot of fun. It's a it's a full auction and dinner and all of that good stuff. And this time we are going beach ball. So we are going gala. Um, and it's ball gowns and flip flops. And that oh be beach August the beach 12. ball. I get it. Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. The beach ball. So um, we always have a costume contest. So I expect to see a lot of very creative um, outfits. Think Met Gala, but for the beach. Um, and. Yeah, it's it's August the twelfth um, at the Montage in Indianapolis. So oh, we'll put one that is, one is coming up, and one is uh, you know a couple months away. But I'm sure it will be here before we know it because you know how events go. <laughs> yeah, we sure do. And we're I'm so glad that the One Cause software will be supporting your events. Um, you know, it's always great to hear that we can be part of bettering, you know, bettering bet tomorrows with each other and powering your mission. So um, thank you for being a valued customer of One Cause and Absolutely. we'll be rooting for you. And hopefully you. our team is um, giving you all the, all the things that you need to be super successful. So, well, it's been such an inspiration. I'm, I have those dates on my personal calendar. I'm going to try to see if I can coordinate some business travel and um, catch you guys there, but I'm sure we'll catch up again. If it's not at a book signing event or one of your events or raise, um, you know, our paths will cross again. And I super, you know, I'm super excited and look forward to it and just would want to continue following your story because you are such an amazing storyteller, Madison. And I know, Brittany, you're going to be joining that storyboard um, as well. So it's it's super exciting. Um, Fearless Fundraisers, unfortunately, I know we can talk to Brittany and Madison probably for hours, but that is all, about all the time we have for today. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's Raise Nation topic and your daily dose of fundraising inspiration. Tune in for a new episode release every Thursday at 12.30 p.m. That's Thursday, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. But in the meantime, listen to all the episodes on Raise Nation Radio. Follow the channel that you like best. We stream on all the favorites. This way you can get notifications about all of our new guests. Fundraisers are doing amazing things to build better tomorrows for our communities. The stories, as you just heard, are awe-inspiring. You won't want to miss a single episode. I would like to thank our sponsor, One Cause for making this show possible. One Cause is driving the future of fundraising with easy to use software solutions that help nonprofits connect with their donors. Check it out at onecause.com. Visit the resource tab on the homepage for a broad catalog of eBooks and blogs and success stories and a profile of Madison's award when she was storyteller of the year and all that good stuff. I'm sure you'll find it helpful. A huge shout out and thanks to my guests, Madison Gonzalez, and Brittany Babbitt, I got that right, um, for sharing just um, an, an expert and authentic voice on a very delicate topic, being thought leaders and storytellers and passionate about the clients and they serve and, and the mission that they support. Madison, Brittany, thank you so much um, for being with us today. I, I truly enjoyed and was inspired by our conversation, but I'd love to ask any last words of inspiration for our audience. Madison first, Brittany second, what do you got for us? I would say what I always teach, and that is that everyone has a story um, and that you can learn at least one thing from everybody that you meet. Um, so approach every conversation with the intent and the expectation that you'll learn something and you will. Uh, Brittany, how about you? Uh, I think that my 
motto has always been that I'm not in the business to save people. I'm in it to love them. So just keep it's, loving your neighbor and that'll spread enough light in itself. Oh, beautiful things. What a perfect way to end this episode. Thank you again so much. I really appreciate your time, ladies. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Don. Well, that's a wrap. Until next time, I'm Don Lego. This is Raise Nation Radio. Stay fearless out there. Oh, 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 oh,